All right, enough of this preamble. Let's get into the call to worship. Please join me in the call to worship from Psalm 107. Welcome to those of you who are online this morning or who are watching the service a little bit later. (laughs) Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures when? Forever. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. For the Lord satisfies the thirsty and together and the hungry God fills with good things. Let's Let's uh, meditate on this opening prayer. I'm just going to ask you to listen and pray quietly as I lead us. Gracious God, as we gather in this sacred space, we lift our hearts in gratitude and praise for you are good and your steadfast love endures forever. Every good and perfect gift comes from your hand and your love sustains us through every season of our lives. Holy Spirit, we are hungry for your grace, hungry for your healing, hungry for your peace, hungry for the living bread, and ready to give what we have received. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. I want to welcome Beth and Steve, wherever you are. Beth and Steve Swanson are here today. I think uh, if they may be out talking with folks on the patio, but they'll be here a little bit later. And we've got a group back here that they have called themselves the Soggy Mountain Singers. And uh, they even invited me to play today, which is a real risk. And uh, think about what it was like in your youth group, maybe when you were a kid. I know we're going to sing a song this morning that was uh, one of the ones we sang a lot when I was a teenager. And uh, picking up an instrument, playing with your family or your grandparents, and sing along. Okay, please stand and praise the Lord. The first one we'll do is a hymn. One of my favorites, actually, it is Well With My Soul. If you want the music, it's page 495 in the hymn book. And we're going to do this a little differently with... The chorus, the choir will sing the verse, it is well, and the congregation will sing with my soul. Let's rehearse it.
change of pace, uh, this one needs no introduction. Good morning, St. John's. It's good to see you all. My name is Nancy Ashley, and I'm the director of Children and Family Ministries. 
And at this time, I would like the children to come forward. We did this once before. It's not scary. Come on, Naomi, you do. <laughs> you remember this. I want to talk to you guys about something. Have a seat. Hi, guys. Is there any other children? All right. Well, um, I think I'm going to go over here so that I can. Why does it, Miss Nancy, sit on the floor? What is it again, Hannah? That's right. <laughs> anyway, we're going to try it on some steps. You got something. Hey, Matt. I'm going to pass out some little cards today, and everybody can take one home because you don't have to be able to read it to use it, but it's a copy of the Lord's Prayer. So, Hannah, can you pass those out to everybody? Give one and pass it around. When we're up here these days, we are talking about things that Jesus said. There's yellow and gold. You can each have one. Yeah, like that. Pass them around. Everybody get one. And we're talking about the things that Jesus said in the Bible. And so, one of the things that Jesus yeah, take one and pass it. Everybody will get one later. But one of the things that Jesus says in the Bible is that he teaches us how to pray. And so one time his disciples were sitting with him and they said, Jesus, how do we pray? And Jesus said, this is how you pray. And so we have what we call the Lord's Prayer. And you will hear it over and over and over again, all the way through your childhood and into teenage years and adulthood, and you will eventually memorize it, just like everybody else in the sanctuary. We all know it. But I'm just going to read it to you, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. So the Lord Prayer goes like this. It says, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our sins as we learn to forgive those who sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, right? So today we'll just talk about the first two lines and the next time we'll talk about the next ones. So the first line says, our Father who art in heaven, can you guys say that? Say, Very good. And what that means is it means that we can say, our Father. Father, our God, who is like a parent, is everywhere. Not just in a sky somewhere, but he's, God is everywhere. And we can talk to God like we can talk to our parents. We can be honest, and we can talk easily, and we're not afraid to talk to God, just like you're not afraid to talk to your parents. And then the second line says, hallowed be your name. Hallowed is a big word that means holy. And so God is so great that even his name is holy. And so when we talk to God, we want to say, you're so wonderful that even your name is holy, and we want to talk about it, and we want to praise you all the time. All right, so those are the first two lines of what Jesus taught us to say, and with that, we're going to go to Sunday school. Now Miss Nancy has to get up. At this time when uh, Nancy's spent a little time with our children, we wanted to shout out a couple of our young people today. First uh, off, Naomi uh, Ross got some special awards just recently for bilingual brilliance and most improved. Where is, where is Naomi? She's on her way out. Just <laughs> Naomi, we're giving you a shout out. And the, the other one, the other young adult we want to honor is Charles Blanchard. Charlie, are you here today? Not here today. Hopefully you're watching this online. I want to just congratulate you for the amazing performance as Monsieur Furman, Richard Furman, in The Phantom of the Opera, Samuel High. And that was a fabulous uh, performance. If you haven't seen it, it's too late now. But it was, <laughs> it, it was amazingly good. It was just incredible, professional. And uh, congratulations, Charlie, for being a part of that. And now I think uh, we're going to, what's the next thing we do here? I've completely lost track of everything. Maria, Maria's gonna come and lead us in prayer.
I wanted to um, thank the Soggy Mountain Singers because <laughs> you guys brought me to tears. Um, and I am so blessed and refreshed when others sh when you all share your gifts with me. Oh man, that was awesome. I was having a hard morning, probably because of daylight savings. And I was anxious and I was having that like kind of nightmare, like what if I don't show up to be worship assistant? And it's so embarrassing because everybody knows I'm worship assistant today. But I got here <laughs> on time. 10.01, that's close enough, right? Uh, and then Nancy, Ashley, um, I had forgot, gotten what hallowed means. And she reminded me that it means holy. <laughs> so I learned from Miss Nancy all the time even though I'm like way older than all these little kids, but. So today's prayer. I want to in read an introduction. It will help me calm down and center us in on the congregational prayer. Good morning, family and welcome to this fourth Sunday of Lent. During this season, let us prepare by becoming more acutely aware of our Lord Jesus' sacrifice for us. Remembering that it was needed in order for us to be fully reconciled to God for all eternity. and meditating on the wondrous facts that God is always perfectly holy, pure, <laughs> righteous, and he's always love. And part of this important and sacred preparation includes self-examination, uh, which includes examining our conscience. For as the scriptures tell us in Proverbs 20, 27, the Lord gave us mind and conscience. We cannot hide from ourselves. So let us spend the next minute or so in silent meditation as we allow the Holy Spirit to highlight any unrepentant sins in our minds in our spirits, in our conscience, and in our hearts. And you need not be afraid because God forgives us. So let us just be attentive to what he wants to tell us.
Heavenly Father, you are the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1, reminds us of that. And we ask you, Heavenly Father, to forgive us of all of our sins. Truly, that is what this season of Lent is all about. It's about forgiveness and how you love us and how you've made a way for us to be reconciled to you. Help us to remember to repent when we need to repent, Lord God. We pray for all of those that are suffering in different ways. We pray for those that cannot pray for themselves because their minds are fragmented. We pray for those who have lost hope. We pray for those who are full of fear and anxiety. We pray for the lost. We pray for those who are full of hate. We pray for those who are full of anger. We pray for those who are full of sorrow. Because you died and rose again, we know that you have overcome and conquered all those things that would seek to destroy us. With full confidence and with a prayer of thanksgiving, we meditate and read Psalm 32. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. Oh, when I refuse to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confess all my sins to you and stop trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Therefore, let all the godly pray to you while there is still time, that they may not drown in the flood waters of judgment. For you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. This is a promise, my brethren. Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and bridle to keep it under control. Many sorrows come to the wicked but unfailing love surrounds those who trust the Lord. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all you who obey him. Shout for joy, all you whose hearts are pure. And with this, let us move into the Lord's Prayer, remembering that <laughs> hallowed means holy, and he really is holy. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Gracious God, we thank you for speaking now again to us through your word, and we invite you, Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit to come and to move in our hearts. Do the hidden work, Lord, that only you can do. We, uh, we thank you for bringing us into this community in which we have the opportunity to pray and to praise and to center ourselves again in your will. Speak, Lord, to us again. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm continuing a series on the Lord's Prayer, and we're just taking it one phrase at a time. And this morning, give us this day our daily bread. Let's return to Matthew chapter 6, a little hybrid of Matthew 6 and Luke chapter 11, in which Jesus uh, begins to teach his disciples how to pray. So Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And so he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let your kingdom come and let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. So when Jesus gives us the okay to pray for, for bread, it marks a shift in the Lord's Prayer. And today we begin to shift. We begin to shift from uh, the, the, the very lofty and beautiful thoughts about God, God as like a, a, a loving parent or a loving father who uh, is accessible, who is as far out as we can imagine in the heavens, but also as near as the air that we breathe. And we pray that that name, the name of God, the name of the Lord, the living God, would be hallowed, would be blessed, would be honored throughout the world. Because we know that this world will never go right until God is truly honored in our hearts as a world and then we pray that the kingdom of God, the, the range of God's effective will, or whatever God wants done is done, that that kingdom would continue to advance and to grow like a tiny little seed grows, a mustard seed grows into a tree. 
And so in a sense, we pray patiently, but also hopefully and expectantly that God's kingdom is continuing to do its work, not just out there, but also in us. And Jesus really spells it out that that's not just a prayer about the future, but it's actually a prayer about God's will being done today on earth, here and now, as it is in heaven. And I find that to be such an exciting thought, (laughs) that God's kingdom, God's will, would be advanced on earth as it is in heaven. Not just a future reality, but a present reality. But now Jesus is going to speak about some very earthly concerns. The, the, The trajectory of the prayer really goes from heaven to earth. And so now we're going to be praying about things like daily bread. And we're going to be talking about forgiveness next week. And we're going to be talking about temptation and trials. Things that we have to deal with on a very human level. Very human concerns, very human needs, very human matters. So clearly, in this prayer, we think of prayer as a very spiritual thing we are to bring to God very earthly concerns. There's something very earthy and earthbound in a beautiful way about Jesus' prayer. It's not just about heavenly thoughts and ideas, but it's actually about what's going on all around us and right here in our own lives. So I want to unpack this prayer. This is an incredibly pragmatic and practical prayer that Jesus calls us to pray right now, and it's a world-shaping prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. That Jesus wants us to pray for our daily bread means that God cares about our most basic needs. Jesus says, it's okay. I want you to pray for bread. I want you to pray about your most basic concerns, your most basic needs. And when we assume that God is only concerned about our Sunday worship or about Bible reading or how much we pray, we're really missing the point of the Lord's Prayer. In fact, God is concerned with the most basic needs, the most basic concerns that occupy our thoughts, our hearts and minds on a daily basis, the things that keep us up at night. The stuff that really tags at our hearts. Over the centuries, Christians have sometimes tried to spiritualize this request, of course. (laughs) Spiritualize it right out of the possibility of being practiced. And they've tried to say that it's really about just spiritual food. We're praying for spiritual food. But the plain sense of the passage is that Jesus is talking about physical bread for physical people in a material world. And so Jesus is encouraging us to step in to the reality that we are both spiritual beings and we are very much material beings. And what we care about in relation to our world, the earth, and the concerns around us matter to God. Matter is God's idea, and matter matters to God. So Jesus says in other places, in Matthew 6, Don't worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. And we should be grateful that Jesus also said, for our heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Bread matters to God, and God cares about those things, those basic necessities and those basic needs that we have. Because bread requires money, Money requires work, work requires good health, and a just government, and so on, and so on, and so forth. And all of that is wrapped up in that prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. This prayer for the everyday necessities of life is is completely consistent with what we see in Jesus' own pattern of life, in his ministry, and his work. After all, he's the one who fed the multitudes the bread, just as he also preach to them that great sermon. He's the one who turned water into wine in John's gospel. And by the way, wine was considered a necessity in the first century. 
He was the one who ministered to the sick and to the outcasts. He's the one who told us that when we give even a cup of cold water, remember when Jesus said that? If you give even a cup of cold water in my name, you will not lose your reward. Just a cup of cold water. And he urged his disciples to get some rest. What could be more earthly than that? Give us this day our daily bread, our daily rest, our health. The word we translate daily or for the coming day, epiusios, is a beautiful word, and it, re- it occurs actually nowhere else in all of ancient literature except in this prayer and maybe in one other place, and they're kind of debating whether or not this is actually the word because it's a little hard to write out. But in that other literature, it's a papyrus fragment, it's actually part of a shopping list. And in that shopping list, there are things like uh, chickpeas and straw and other per- personal items, and Epiusion appears to be written across it as though it was a shopping list for the coming day. And I take that to mean, let's just assume that that's the word, that we are to bring our shopping list to God. We are to bring our our basic needs to God. And that includes a lot of stuff, everyday concerns, a good job, food on the table, our health, adequate clothing, a roof over our heads, good teachers, and I would even include within daily bread the gift of of friendship. I was having a conversation with uh, Brian, I don't know if Brian, I don't see Brian right now, but Brian Baldridge was, and I were talking about yet last week's message, and he was mentioning the, the spiritual practices of Jesus. We were talking about some of his spiritual practices. And one of the ones that I did not mention last week, and it was a big oversight, was Jesus' spiritual practice of hanging out with people, eating and drinking with his disciples, for which he was accused by the religious professionals, as well as with those folks who were outside the religious circle. And that is absolutely one of Jesus' spiritual practices. It was the practice of community which we are also called into, and of having friendship with each other and also with those that are outside the religious sphere. Jesus commanded us through the example of his life to do that. And how desperately among the things that we pray for when we pray for daily bread is the gift of of friendship, the gift of companionship, the gift of encouragement, Uh, the gift of those who will walk alongside us in pain and in joy. And all of that, I believe, is also included in addition to the roof and the clothes and the health and the food and the job. But let's go on, because that Jesus wants us to pray for our daily bread means that God encourages a habit of trust and humility and gratitude. And here I want to really focus on this idea of daily bread. Daily bread, the food for tomorrow. In the first century, bread did not have a preservative in it, and so bread had to be baked every day, fresh. Every day. Bread for the coming day. And so when Jesus counsels us to pray for our daily bread, it's reminding us that we need to set aside our our anxieties and our worries about the distant and the unknown future and trust in the Lord's provision right now. Now, even as we say that, there's a part of us that's going, wait a minute. Don't we need to be concerned a little bit about the future? And I want us to think about that, but hold on. Right now I want us to sit with this idea of trusting in God's provision today. One day at a time. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, Do not worry about your life, 
what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. I think Jesus was probably thinking about the old people of God as they were exiting Egypt and they had gone out into the wilderness and they were complaining to Moses about how they had no bread and Moses went to God and the Lord gave them this, this flaky substance that they called manna, which literally means, what is it? And they collected it, and what the Lord says about what is it is you collect enough for today, or I guess it's enough for tomorrow, literally, but not more than that. You couldn't collect more than that. And if they tried to collect more, it would dissolve. It wouldn't last. So you could only collect enough of this, what is it, bread, for, for today. And I think Jesus is, is saying the same thing. I want you to pray for today's bread, your needs for today. I want you to center yourself in the present moment. And focus on what is happening today. You know, how often have we allowed our minds and our hearts to go to the future and worry about what is not in our control. And Jesus brings us back into the present and says, I want you to begin by trusting in the immensity of God's provision. I want you to think about all the ways that God provides for you. Think about that. The lesson of the manna was obvious. God would be our daily provider. But I know some of you are thinking, Pastor, get serious. The bread on my table is there because I get up at 6 a.m. I get out on the 405 freeway, and I slog to work. And maybe I'm working two jobs, and I know some of you are, in addition to working all night long. And uh, some of you still get to church in the morning, and you've been working all night. And the food is there because I earned my paycheck, and I went to the store to pay for it. And if there's a daily provider, who is it? It's me. That's when I want to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, which says... It is God who gives you the power to get wealth. It is God who gives you the power to get wealth. In other words, don't forget words that begin with the letter S. I'm thinking about God's sovereignty. I'm thinking about, how about our spot in the solar system? If we were anywhere else, we'd be living on a rock with not much to breathe. How about the soil? How about the seed? How about the showers? How about a sharp mind? How about a strong body? How about a stable government? How about the stock person who puts food on the shelves for us to buy in the supermarket? The fact that we live and breathe at all is, a, is an, inc an incredible gift, isn't it? Give us this day our daily bread. Think about all the daily gifts when you wake up that you are given. When you open your eyes. The incredible provision of this life. To live and to breathe, let alone eat, involves this complex web of events that really should inspire humility every single day and a deep, deep sense of gratitude. And living with gratitude, wow, what a game changer. That verse that the Lord gave me on my sabbatical, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, be grateful in all circumstances. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And that's helped me so much. But let's keep thinking about this phrase a little deeper because when Jesus encourages us to pray for our daily bread, it reminds me that I'm not only to pray and work for my bread, but also for our bread, the bread 
of those around me. So let's just press into that idea. Give us this day, our, and look at, look at the people around you, our daily bread. You're praying for one another. You really are. Jesus didn't tell us to pray, give me my daily bread. He taught us to pray, give us our daily bread. On one occasion when the disciples wanted Jesus to send the crowds away so that they could get something to eat, Jesus said, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. You give them something to eat, Jesus said. In the parable of the sheep and the goats, Jesus warns his disciples to take very, very seriously, we're talking about Matthew chapter 25 here, their commission to feed, to shelter, and to clothe those who are in need. This, this parable is often so overlooked. And I want us to press in. Let's hear these words again. Come, the Savior says, at the, end of, at the end of the world, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. And of course, the righteous say, when did we do any of that? And Jesus said, I, let's keep reading. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. And then Jesus says to them, truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. And later he says, and as much as you did not do it to the least of these who are members of my family, you did not do it to me. So sadly, we have to think about all the ways that we have not done it. All the, all the places, all the parts of the world where Folks are lacking the compassion of Jesus through his people. You know, over three million children die every year from hunger-related diseases. And I was checking my UN statistics in the 2023 edition of the UN State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World. Between 691 and 783 million people faced hunger in 2022 an increase of 122 million compared to 2019. And I don't have the statistics for this year, but unbelievably $38 million worth of food is thrown away in the United States every year. And 40 to 50% of all food ready for harvest never gets eaten. So the problem is not with the quantity or the availability of food. The problem is with the righteous distribution of that food. World hunger is exacerbated by war and famine and drought and inefficient agricultural practices and political corruption and third world debt. And think about what's happening in the most war-torn parts of the world right now. Think about what's happening in Gaza. Think about what's happening in Ukraine. Think about those who are the most vulnerable, and there you will see people starving from a lack of bread. And as Jesus' people, we should be crying out, how can we do something about that? Is there anything that we can do? Is there anything you can do? I'll give you one little suggestion. There's something called the One Great Hour of Sharing that we receive every year at this time. And Jim Lamb would be happy to tell you more about it. It's one of the most powerful tools we have in the Presbyterian Church to address world hunger. It's called the One Great Hour of Sharing, which directly supports world hunger relief via the Presbyterian Hunger Fund. And don't underestimate the power of the one great hour of sharing. You're going to hear more about it this month. But as those who come from one of the richest countries, if not the richest country in the world, we have power to give. But I want to say finally the fact that it's Jesus who encourages us to pray, 
give us this day our daily bread is so important to remember. So important to remember because it reminds us to pray that a starving world be given something only he can give, and that's what we like to call the bread of life. The bread of life. He's urging us to pray for physical bread, but if that was all that the world needed, right? If that was all we needed was physical bread, then we could be saved by bagels and naan and wonder bread alone, right? And all of those things are good. They're important. They're powerful. They're sustaining. But without the power of the love of Christ in us, the love of God overwhelming us, we don't have the power to be compassionate and to love one another as we love ourselves. We need the Spirit of Jesus in us, feeding our souls, reshaping the world from a world of selfishness, me, myself, and mine. And, and, and retraining our thoughts, our minds, our habits into a world of generosity and kindness. The bread, we call it the milk of human kindness. The bread of human kindness. That comes from a change within our hearts that the Lord wants to give us. It's been said, I've heard, and I checked with a friend there's a saying in China that every person has two stomachs, one that can be satisfied by things like fish and potatoes and vegetables, but there's another stomach, a proverb, that can only be f- satisfied by rice. And as much as you fill the one stomach with all that other stuff, if you don't get the rice, you don't really feel full. And I love that that proverb because I really believe that Jesus, the living word, the living God made visible, is the rice of life. He's the rice of life. He's the one that fills that other stomach that nothing else can satisfy. I am the rice of life, the bread of life, Jesus said. I alone can satisfy your deepest hunger, your deepest soul, deep yearnings. And the one who comes to me, Jesus says, shall not hunger. And the one who believes in me shall not thirst. And the world that believes in me will grow less and less hungry every day. We'll begin to experience the compassion and the love and the grace and the power of the living God in a world the way God intended it to be on earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus, the bread of life, has sent us into the world to fill hungry stomachs and hungry souls, empowering us as we pray in his name, Lord, give us, can you say it with me? Give us this day our daily bread. Let's think about that in this moment of silent meditation.
I'd like to invite you to pray with me this prayer response. Put your hands out. <laughs> Just as a sign of receptivity to the abundance of God's provision and allow him to fill you up again today. Gracious God, how we struggle to trust you for our daily needs day after day. Forgive us when we deny your care for us, when we worry and grow anxious about tomorrow, fearfully grasping what we do have and refusing to receive from or share with others. Forgive us, O Lord, for our malnourished faith. Please fill us with your Holy Spirit and strengthen us with the truth of your word, that we may live in the light of your generous provision, pray and work for our daily necessities, and share with open hands and open hearts the abundance of your gifts with those in need. Living God, it is our desire to feed others for you first fed us, to clothe others for you first clothed us, to love others for you first loved us, through Jesus, the bread of life, in whose name we pray, amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing. They'll know we are Christians by our love. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in Just a couple of notes before we say goodbye this morning. First of all, I want to thank you for your giving in all ways. 
And there's always an opportunity to give on your way out or online. But thank you for your stewardship. Thank you for the ways that you support this church, your gifts, your time, and your special talents. Uh, also, I want to thank you for seriously considering uh, signing up for, uh, I guess, our small group study that continues this uh, journey through the Lord's Prayer. And then also uh, the silent retreat that's coming down the road on April 26, 27, and 28. I know that Rita Augustine, who's leading that retreat, will be out at a table today and that you can talk with her about that uh, beautiful time in silence, which is a powerful spiritual discipline out uh, in St. Andrew's Abbey. I've been there. It's an amazing place in the high desert. And then I want to strongly urge you and encourage you to sign up for the blood drive on March the 17th if you can give blood. Unfortunately, I can't give blood this time because I'm taking a medication that I can't give blood. But I want to encourage you to do it because I can't do it. So please do it for me. <laughs> it's, I love to give blood. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful feeling. It's a direct way of helping people. And you're giving the gift of life. You really are. And it's such a personal gift, and it really doesn't hurt. It's not a big deal, so try it. Maybe just a little bit when you get the prick, but I don't find it to be a big deal. But go to St. John's Press 11,000. That's your sponsor code. And really seriously consider giving blood. It's a powerful way of helping uh, other people deeply in need. And I believe that's the last of our... I want to say, again, Beth and Steve Swanson are here today. They're right over here. And they live in Nevada, and we miss them so much. These two have been incredible leaders in our church. They have left a mark that endures. And I want you to give them a hug. Get to know them if you don't. They're right over there. And for those of you who are here for the first time or you're visiting, God bless you. Thank you for being here. I will be here after the service if you want to talk. I want to say, if you have anything to say or you want to dialogue with me about the message today, please do. I'd love to do that. You don't have to agree with everything I say, believe me. And if you want to talk, I'm, I love to have a dialogue. So please do. And I'm always available for a cup of coffee. Remember that. Some people are taking me up on it. The coffee's on me. So, <laughs> you, you know, don't. Come on. Do it. All right, now let's receive the, ble the benediction this morning. Oh, and there's prayer right here for those who would like prayer after the service. We are a praying church, and we would love to pray for you. <laughs> and now may the living Christ, the bread of life, go with you. May he go behind you to encourage you, beside you to, prevent, to befriend you, above you to watch over you, within you to give you power, and before you to show the way. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.